Spirit. Amen. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Let us go rejoicing to the house of the Lord. And Thanks be to God. Thank you very much. It's beautiful, the beautiful spirit that we have as we gather this day. Especially rejoicing that we're able to come and sing praise to God and offer God glory and praise. As we gather together as God's people, united in God's love, let us pause and be mindful of the ways that God calls us to live as his children. Just acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the Savior this You are sent to heal with the entire heart, Lord, have mercy.
first reading is a reading from the book of Kings. In those days, Elijah the prophet went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the entrance of the city, a widow was gathering sticks there, and he called out to her, Please, bring me a small cup full of water to drink. She left to get it, and he called out after her, Please, bring along a bit of bread. She answered, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked. There is only a handful of flour in my jar, and a little oil in my jug. Just now I was collecting a couple of sticks to go in and prepare something for myself and my son. When we have eaten it, we shall die. Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go and do as you propose. But first, make me a little cake and bring it to me. Then you can prepare something for yourself and your son. For the Lord, the God of Israel, says, The jar of flour shall not go empty, nor the jug of oil run dry, until the day when the Lord sends rain upon the earth. She left and did as Elijah had said. She was able to eat for a year, and he and her son as well. The jar of flour did not go empty, nor the jug of oil run dry, as the Lord had foretold through Elijah. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks.
If that were so, he would have had to suffer repeatedly from the foundation of the world. But now, once for all, he has appeared at the end of the ages to take away sin by his sacrifice. Just as it is appointed that human beings die once, and after this the judgment, so also Christ, offered once to take away the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to take away sin, but to bring salvation to those who eagerly await him. The word of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. In the course of his teaching, Jesus said to the crowds, Beware of the scribes who like to go around in long robes and accept greetings in the marketplaces, seats of honor in synagogues, and places of honor at marketplace. They devour the houses of widows and as a pretext recite lengthy prayers. They will receive a very severe condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and observed how the crowd was putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow also came and put in two small coins worth two cents. Calling his disciples to himself, he said to them, Amen, I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the other contributors to the treasury. For they all contributed from their surplus wealth, but she, from her poverty, has contributed all she had. Our whole livelihood. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord. A number of years ago, I visited Our Lady of the Angels Cathedral in the city of Los Angeles. I'm reminded today of one of the features of that cathedral that struck me at the time. Perhaps you've been there, you'll also recall it. Hanging on the walls of this large cathedral are large tapestries. 
tapestry groups, the most prominent is the communion of saints along the south and north walls of the main body of the church, the nave of the church. Twenty-five fresco-like tapestries depict 135 saints and blessings. Twenty-five, including holy men and women of North America, canonized by the church. Twelve untitled figures, including children of all ages, represent the many anonymous holy people in our midst. All the figures depict their eyes towards the front of the cathedral, towards the light of the great cross window above the altar, where, of course, the Eucharist is celebrated. And although I didn't have the opportunity to celebrate Mass or attend Mass at the cathedral, as I stood there looking, I couldn't help but think of the opening verse from the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews. It reads, We are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. We are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Especially as we come together today at the Eucharist. Last Monday as a church, we celebrated All Saints Day. And that great cloud of witnesses whose exemplary lives and continued intercessory prayers give us courage and resolve, strength and fortitude, direction and confidence. And now today, we gather in this church, St. Helena or St. Helena, and especially we call one of those witnesses whose feast day we celebrated this past Wednesday, St. Martin de Porres. As we gather this morning to give glory and honor to God, I invite us to be especially mindful of not only the Apostle of Charity, as St. John the 23rd referred to him at his canonization, but to that great cloud of witnesses who precede us and succeed us as witnesses for us today. Let us be mindful of the witnesses of the two women who are mentioned in today's first reading of Gospel, as well as those witnesses, especially those of African ancestry, whose faith continue to shine a light upon us today. We begin with today's readings. The first reading in Gospel tells us the stories of widows. The widow about whom we heard in our first reading was living in a time of a year's long drought. Her food had run out, and she knew that she had just enough flour and oil to make one last piece of bread. After she and her son had finished his final meal, they would lie down and die. Suddenly, Elijah, a foreigner, appears to her and asks her to make something for her to eat, for him to eat. A rather incredible request of a woman who has hardly anything for herself. He assures her that God will take care of her. And this saintly woman, she accedes to his request and does as she is asked. She trusts the word that this stranger has given to her and responds to his need. We, only, we now jump ahead a few centuries and are brought to this grand and glorious temple of Jerusalem where people are magnificently dressed and placing their offerings in one of the 13 receptacles located in the temple area. It's quite a show to behold. Since the temple, since the receptacles are shaped like a trumpet, 
and ring out the clanging of the coins as they're dropped into the receptacles. Jesus, however, is not listening to the sound of the coins that are being dropped, but rather, he's looking into the hearts of those who are dropping the coins. And the biggest heart is not the one with the biggest wallet, but this little poor widow who is nothing to her name except the two small, almost worthless coins. It's everything she has. And Jesus watches. She takes those two coins and she drops them into that receptacle. Both of these widows teach us something very important about life, about the life of sanctity. They teach us that God does not measure the gift by its size compared to other people's gifts. God does not care how many people know about what we've done. God does not value things the way the world values things. But God looks into our hearts. And God calls us to trust in opening our hearts to those in need. Like the widow who shares part of her last handful of flour with a stranger. This woman, this, this widow, gives her last two coins away and holds nothing back. We look to the witness of St. Martin de Porres. He was born in Lima, Peru in 1579. He was the illegitimate son of a Spanish gentleman and a freed slave from Panama. At a young age, Martin's eight father abandoned him. His mother and his younger sister left Martin to grow in deep poverty. After spending just two years in primary school, he was placed with a barber surgeon where he would learn to cut hair and medical arts. Martin, though, desired to enter religious life and eventually was accorded this. In being accepted, he was consigned to doing the most menial tasks, working in the kitchen, doing laundry and cleaning. But he also cared for the sick. He became known for encompassing the virtues needed to carefully and patiently care for those who were ill in the most difficult of situations. He was praised for his unconditional care of all people regardless of race or wealth. He took care of everyone, from Spanish nobles to the African slaves, slaves. Martin didn't care if the person was diseased or dirty. He would welcome them to his own home. Martin reflected his great love for God and of all God's gifts. It is said that he had many extraordinary abilities, he was able to buy locate. He was able to instantly cure people. He had a miraculous knowledge, a spiritual knowledge. He also founded an orphanage for abandoned children and slaves. And was known for raising a dowry for young girls in short amounts of time. One story is told of an epidemic when those who were very ill in the monastery were locked away in a distant section and kept away from the professed. On more than one occasion, Martin passed through the locked doors to care for the sick. When it was found out, he risked being disciplined for not following the rules of the convent. He counted, however, by saying, forgive my error and please instruct me, for I did not know that the precept of obedience took precedence over that of charity, and he was given liberty to follow.
follow his heart. Another witness is Pierre Toussaint, a Haitian immigrant living in New York City. Some have called him the father of Catholic charities in New York. He was a daily mass communicator and a successful businessman who, with his wife, took in orphans, helped raise funds for the first Catholic orphanage, and began the city's first school for black children. We think of Thea Bowman, who died in 1989 and was a religious sister, a gifted musician, and a teacher. She was only in her 50s when she died from cancer. She used many of her gifts to help us pray as a church, as the people of God, to hear the gospel and to rise to today's challenges. And although diagnosed with breast cancer and experiencing the side effects of chemotherapy, she continued her active outreach to all. One of her beautiful lines, things she would say is that she's planning to live until she dies. And she did just that. We think of Pierre Toussaint via Bowman. We think of Mont de Porres. But we also think of all those other people as we think of that tapestry in that cathedral in Los Angeles who are the unnamed saints. Those who have made us who we are this day, especially those of who have come to this country, who have come to this country to help us, perhaps parents, grandparents. We think of the people who continue to inspire us, and we hold them up to God in our prayer. And we look to them, this great cloud of witnesses, so that we too can go forth and bring the gospel to others.
consecrated religious life, and the permanent diaconate, we pray. For all the veterans who have served our nation, especially those who have suffered in mind, body, and spirit, we pray. For all who are working and contributing to the success of our parish Christmas bazaar, we pray. Russell Cahill, Marie Spinden, Anita Tarwaski, Rosemary Turkoll, Stephanie Bidwell, Dolly Alvarez, Thomas Leo, and all the sick and of our parish and families, that they experience the healing strength and peace, we pray. For Jacqueline Wilson, for whom this Mass is being offered, all the faithful departed, that this rejoice, that we rejoice in eternal life, we pray. We pause in the silence and remember our personal needs. In confident trust, we pray. O oh good and loving God, we ask you to look upon us all of our needs, which we have placed in your loving care. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Quiet on the stand.
celebrating in mystery the passion of her son, we may honor it with loving devotion in Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We give love to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, and to God, through Christ our Lord, proud of compassion for the waywardness that is ours, he humbled himself and was born of the Virgin. By the passion of the cross, he freed us from every death. By rising from the dead, he gave us life eternal. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as we are We Holy Spirit may become one body 
Holy Spirit, Christ. May He make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. Helena, the St. Martin of Rhodes, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May the sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis our Pope and William our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people who have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. And your compassion and merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children, scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing through this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lord. Please join us in your communion hymn, number 331, Taste and See, number 331.
if you get to the communion meditation. Because then the deacon's doing something too.
Let us pray. Nourished by this sacred gift, O Lord, we give you thanks and beseech your mercy that by the outpour, by the pouring forth of your spirit, the grace of integrity may endure in those who are heavenly power has entered. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Just be seated.
because he was the patron saint of Universal Brotherhood. This Mass is celebrated annually as a means of promoting racial harmony in the Diocese of Wilmington. One of Jackie's lifelong goals was to combat racism within the Catholic Church. She wanted to develop a ministry to black Catholics to evangelize the unchurched and the fallen away black Catholics in the community. Jackie wanted to focus on ways to create a welcoming environment for all black Catholics within the church. Jackie loved it. And let people know that the Catholic Church is a universal church, home to everyone, and that we as black Catholics have a home in the Catholic Church. As Jackie once said, we belong here too. Amen. Amen. Jackie was a true disciple of Christ because she had a servant's heart. She had a humble, generous spirit, a heart full of love and compassion. God and for God's people. Jesus once said that he came to serve and not to be served. He also gave us the great commission to go forth and preach the gospel and make disciples of all the nations. Jackie's life of service to the church was a testament of her deep faith in Christ. She was not only a devout Catholic, but she was a visionary a mentor, an evangelist, an author, and a born leader. Her roots of evangelization began back in the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C., where she labored in the vineyard, so to speak, for over 25 years. As executive director for the Office of Black Catholics in the Archdiocese of Washington, she helped to reactivate the National Black Catholic Congress movement. This movement had organized national gatherings of black Catholics back in the 1800s, but it stopped for about 100 years until 1987, when it was restarted at the Catholic University in Washington, D.C. Because of her success, she was appointed by Pope St. John Paul II as an observer and a speaker at the 1977 Synod on Evangelization in the Americas. And for this, she traveled to South Africa. When Jackie retired in 2004, she moved here to Wilmington to live with her daughter in the vicinity of St. Helena's Parish. Jackie wanted to withdraw from her busy schedule, but she was energized by the Holy Spirit to continue her loving service. <coughs> when we learned of Jackie's arrival in the Wilmington area, we enlisted her help as a member of the board to serve on the board of the Ministry for Black Catholics. Jackie's wealth of knowledge and experience made her an ideal mentor for the leadership of the MBC. And in 2006, she authored a book entitled Today, Yesterday, and Forever, which is a document, documented history of the Black Catholic lay administrators. And it included guidelines for establishing an office of Black Catholic ministries at the diocesan level. Father Paul Williams, a friar of the Order of Friar Miners, was the previous director for the Ministry of Black Catholics for over seven years. He stated that Jackie played an important role because she was able to connect influential African Americans and the Catholic community at large to further the goals of the MBC here in Wilmington. As a member of the board of the MBC, Jackie served as the liaison to the National Office for the National Black Catholic Congress. In 2012, she was a speaker and moderator for a Dawson Day of Reflection here in Wilmington to prepare parishioners to attend and participate in the next upcoming Black Catholic Congress 11, which was being held in Indianapolis, Indiana. There at the Congress 11, 
she received the Servant of Christ Award, which is in recognition of 25 years of outstanding leadership and service to the church in the African American community. Upon return from Congress of Heaven, she helped to formulate plans for evangelization here in the Diocese of Wilmington as part of the National Black Catholic Pastoral Plan, which was adopted at the Congress. Jackie was also active in the Knights and Ladies of St. Peter Clay, the Ladies Auxiliary, and she transferred her membership from Washington to here locally to the court in Wilmington. Jackie was also active in the pro life movement. She and I served on the Diocesan Respect Life Committee, and Jackie was a team member for the Rachel's Vineyard Retreat retreat team that administered healing retreats to women and men who had experienced a death of a child by abortion. Jackie always had time to listen and give helpful advice to those who sought her help. She was always encouraging and supportive of those who needed her help. These were just a few of the many activities that she was involved in outside of St. Helena's Parish here, where she was elected a choir member and a member of the parish outreach ministry. I could go on describing her many accomplishments, but the important point is that we too, all of us, have been given gifts by God to serve Him and to serve one another. And Jackie's life was a great example of what it means to be a missionary disciple of Christ. In closing, Cardinal Wilton Gregory commented at Jackie's funeral by saying, the whole church owes an incredible debt to Jackie Wilson. So my friends, let us thank God today for her life and her service to God's people. As we pray together, Eternal rest ran unto her, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon her. May her soul and all the souls of the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. Amen. So God be the glory. Amen. Amen.
love and his peace. Amen. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.